Okay, so hey everyone, and um, welcome to the last day at the OpenStack Summit. Um, I hope everyone here has had a great time over the last couple of days and a really productive week, because there's been some pretty cool stuff we've seen. So by way of introduction, I'm Pete, and I work as the development lead for OpenStack Helm within AT&T, and I'm really lucky to work alongside some really great people in this industry, like uh, Steve Wilkerson, who leads development um, of airships, uh, logging, monitoring, and alerting stack, along with a lot of other OpenStack Helm development, and uh, Tin Lam, who acts as our security ninja. So today, we're going to have a look at some of the possible futures um, that we see for OpenStack and Kubernetes working side by side um, to deliver open, declaratively driven applications on top of open, declaratively driven infrastructure at scale. And I think before we sort of get into this, it's quite important to clarify a few things. When we talk about scale at AT&T, we typically mean two things. Um, we both have a collection of a few large data centers, and at the other end of the spectrum, we're working towards building a huge number of relatively tiny ones. And so it's been solving these really diverse problems that's made working on this project for um, the last year and a half so exciting. As with you know, quite a small focus team within, within AT&T, we've um, dived into the wonderfully and sometimes painfully sort of nautically themed development processes that we've been through. They've taken a holistic approach to cluster management, and we feel we've got some pretty solid solutions to some of the really tricky and long-standing problems for infrastructure management. So where to begin? I think sort of approximately 18 months ago, I was working on some other OpenStack deployment uh, using Kubernetes from Edinburgh in Scotland, um, when Steve phoned me and he said, Hey Pete, do you want to talk to this Alan guy? And so my response was, yeah, that we had owned the fleece. Why not? Sure. And a couple of weeks later, I was living in St. Louis and working with these guys and some of the other brightest and most uh, driven people I've come across in this industry. Uh, many of which had had years of experience in OpenStack and the telco trenches, all single-mindedly focused on delivering a platform that rectified the major issues that our clients face. We needed one that was declarative, because as we start moving out to this scale, the sort of hands-on approach that had been taken to deployment and the sort of huge number of snowflakes that inevitably sort of occur was not, was not a sustainable solution. We needed immutability for both resiliency and security, and it needed to be upgradable so that we could both apply configuration changes, security patches, and something that would adapt to our ever-changing business needs, which can often change you know, in the course of an email thread. So over the last few months, um, so over the next few months, we were plugging away at developing what is now OpenStack Helm, moving through several iterations as we did so. Um, building on the lessons uh, that were learned during the development of uh, Stackinetes, uh, My Old Harbor Project, and Cola Kubernetes, where I met Steve and some of these other guys. And by the Boston Summit uh, last year, we had a really solid grasp on where we felt we were going um, and could solve many of the problems related to OpenStack um, app lifecycle management and treating it as a sort of set of intercollect uh, interrelated applications. However, this is only part of the sort of picture that sort of hits most all, all modern data centers and clouds, of which OpenStack is only one part of this. So we needed to look at sort of bare metal configuration, validation, and integration with both physical and software-defined networks. And so to solve this need, um, eventually we ended up with Airship, which is the collection of projects that we launched at the start of this summit, um, where we took the same approach as with OpenStack Helm to develop a suite of loosely coupled microservices that could manage any container-driven workload via Kubernetes and Helm and scale it in a secure, repeatable, and validated way. And so with, with Airship, we've built a set of APIs and relatively small infrastructure management tools where required, and using the, best, uh, the existing best-in-class tools where possible. In particular, Promenade, led by Mark Burnett, was created to manage Kubernetes clusters on physical hardware, and DryDock was born um, as a pluggable API to front MAS um, to manage uh, bare metal nodes and initial configuration. 
both as tools with the required feature set, uh, both as tools with the required feature set did not exist upstream yet, or would have required too much adaptation to meet our needs and the schedule and timelines that we had. That said, um, for us to both remain agile and lower our technical debt ongoing, we need to remain on top of industry advancements. And in the body of this presentation, we're going to have a look at that um, with a review of what's possible now with Kube ADM and Ironic, both used in combination with OpenStack Helm, and are potential candidates for sort of future back ends um, for these airship components. And rather jokingly, we refer to this as the Schmorbra process. Um, both as it's opening up what was typically being referred to as the OpenStack and Kubernetes sandwich, and we wanted to see if anyone could pronounce it. And I'm pretty sure we've collectively failed at the latter. So I think what we can do now is sort of dig into the, the prototype that we have um, for these potential uh, back-end candidates for Airship and sort of describe what we've, we've done here. So first, we deploy a single-node Kubernetes cluster using a Kube ADM running in self hosted mode, which we've then built a wrapper um, system D unit to recover the cluster following a full outage and rebootstrap it effectively in the same way that when a Galera cluster with MariaDB restarts, you're actually reforming that cluster. Then we deployed OpenStack Helm on above this node uh, using the Queen's release of OpenStack. Uh, with Ceph and highly available support services, including MariaDB, Galera, uh, RabbitMQ, and then allowed bare metal node provisioning driven via Ironic, Heat, and Senlin. So, with this configuration, we first uh, need to go through a few steps where we uh, register nodes with I Ironic. We drive a Heat template with uh, Senlin to provision them and join them into the Kubernetes cluster. And with, with this process, we, we feel there's a potential path in the future for um, doing the, both the initial deployment, rack expansion, and potentially lifecycle management of these nodes via heat software config hooks. In addition, we're using Keystone um, to act as an operator facing authentication and authorization mechanism for the cluster um, via Kubernetes uh, OpenStack uh, cloud provider. Um, which lets operations and potentially one day in the future tenants access to the Kubernetes deployment that's running on our bare metal nodes. Okay. Just sort of to go through this in a bit more detail, um, in, in Airship we have the concept of a genesis process where we instantiate the entire cloud provisioning and lifecycle management tooling uh, using promenades to build a to bring up a resilient Kubernetes cluster. And here with KubeADM, we're following the same pattern uh, responsible to bring the cluster into life. And to do this, we had to take advantage of the declarative configuration file that KubeADM now supports and the phase deployment method, which allows us to deploy critical Kubernetes components as charts and then manage their lifecycle in the same way we do everything else. So things like core DNS, and Calico or any other CNI are just another chart to us. Currently, this doesn't yet match the entire feature set out of the box that we get with Airship, um, namely the instantiation and of a self-managed and highly available etcd cluster that can expand with, uh, with nodes and sort of repair itself, although this gap can be pretty easily resolved either by working upstream or shelling out that component that we have from Airship into a sub-project. Um, and then the other primary function that our promenade component in Airship performs, uh, serving a node joining API, can potentially be simplified in the future as Kubernetes' um, own cluster API is rapidly developing um, and is becoming much more capable in its feature set. So once we've got this sort of self-hosted um, Kubernetes cluster up, we then perform a deployment of OpenStack Helm. And here, um, all the stuff we've done here is actually using the exact same uh, deployment methodology that we have uh, in our upstream gating, which is sort of a, quite a critical part of a lot of the development work that we've done both internally at AT&T because, frankly, it's not internal. We, we have internalized all of our hardware configuration and site definitions. All of the other software we do upstream first.
So I think at this stage we can probably just cut over and have a quick look at what our initially deployed cluster looks like. If I can just go over here. And this is just using the um, cockpit user interface. So this is a, a typical set of workloads running running in, in one of our clusters, which as you can see is a horrendously complicated problem to try and sort of make sense of. Um, we can just get an overview. We can see we have you know, 100, 180 pods running in our production, um, a whole series of volumes. Ceph, Ceph cluster up and running, in this case just a very simple one with three, three OSDs uh, running the luminous release of Ceph. A highly available RabbitMQ cluster um, and then we can sort of actually look into what we're what we're going to do with this space. So now we've got our first host up and running, um, we can start looking at how to build build out a cloud. Um, although for this demo, we're kind of cheating um, again using the same thing that we do in our upstream gates. Uh, we're using a great little project called VBMC which allows us to simulate IPMI um, controlled bare metal machines using libvirt. And, but this gives us the exact same workflow and uh, environment as we get for, say, a single rack deployment. So in order to bring up um, new nodes and join them into this cluster, we've got to go through a few steps. Um, first, we need to register these nodes with Ironic um, using the OpenStack CLI. Then we can perform some initial cleaning and validation of these nodes. And then once that is done, we create flavors that are associated with the node so that we can then use heat to drive Nova, which in turn drives Ironic. Um, though we're closely watching uh, Mogan as a potential front end for, for this solution um, use it with Ironic. So what's quite nice about this is the immediate uh, feedback that we can offer uh, to operators via both the CLI and the Horizon UI, although it's this process that's actually weakest for a potential integration with uh, Airship's dry dock at the moment, as the lack of any declarative input for node specifications with Ironic via a tool such as Heat uh, presents one of the larger, although easily manageable, hurdles we need to cross. To get an idea about what these things look like. In this environment here, we've got just a very simple sort of simulated 10 node cluster where we can get details very, very quickly sort of around the driver information we're using and the initial sort of validation um, in terms of what, what we can actually do with this node as well as its hardware properties as, and any workload that is currently scheduled towards that. So once the nodes are registered, we can expand the Kubernetes cluster that we created in our bootstrapping uh, simply and rapidly using heat, which, as we said, we're going to drive via Senlin. Um, and Senlin, if you're not aware of it, is a really great tool for uh, managing um, homogeneous objects in OpenStack. I, I kind of like to think of it as offering almost a Kubernetes-like scaling model um, for OpenStack, which allows us to simply expand and contract capacity uh, as desired. So within, within this, we just use a very simple cloud init script for this POC um, to deploy kubeADM onto a host and then join that node into a cluster, um, which then gets automatically provisioned with critical infrastructure components like CNI network and uh, kube proxy prod. So once the node is marked online and ready, um, we can just use any typical additional workflows to label the nodes accordingly, and then just expand any existing or new workload out onto them. And with the appropriate labels, we can use this method to move from the single node deployment. We started with three or four, three or more in a master node configuration, providing high availability um, of everything in our management control plane. And to do this, can just demonstrate sort of how simple this is in reality once once we've got everything in place. Should have it clicked over here. So we have declared a very simple hardware and software profile um, for one of our nodes, which 
has a heat template associated with it, which we then get dynamically inject um, credentials into to allow it to join. And then we can just specify that we want to create a node. Select the profile and select which Kubernetes cluster we want this to join to. Okay. And so what, what will happen now is this, this node being created. Um, we go into our management. We should see in a minute or two that this will actually be associated with a bare metal node. And Ironic will go out and provision and orchestrate its, sort of its life cycle. Um, and it's, you know, it's just a very, very simple heat stack we have that is going, going into managing this. And typically, um, after about sort of 10 or 15 minutes, this node will be in the cluster and available for, for use. Well, if I can find the cursor. So for, for us and the OpenStack Helm team, although this has been a really sort of quick push button exercise, this really paints a picture of where OpenStack and Kubernetes should be heading, sort of as two highly complementary ecosystems, where OpenStack provides an open infrastructure lifecycle management and Kubernetes open application lifecycle management. Um, we currently regard the, this solution, at least at the underlay um, or the undercloud, as being essentially single tenant for the moment, as both the security and resource management needed to mature, need to mature in Kubernetes and the underlying uh, container runtime before we can consider this solution capable of multi-tenant uh, operation. But as a community, we're really actively working in this area to achieve the goal. And in particular, TIN has been doing some work with our security team to help bring Keystone authentication into the picture. I can just hand over to him now. Thanks, Pete. Uh, as most of you may know, Keystone is an identity service providing authentication and authorization for all OpenStack services. It allows the operator uh, to authenticate users stored it, you know, in SQL backend, LDAP, Active Directory, or Federation, such as OpenIDC. User can authenticate it using a number of plugins that are now available in Keystone, such as the canonical you know, user and passwords, uh, Kerberos, or the recently introduced uh, application credentials. An authentication user, did you, when you authenticate against Keystone, will be given a token, and the user can then use a the token to perform a certain action, for example, creating a server using Nova. So when you issue this token, the, the service will then check against the appropriate policy file uh, using ASO policy, and if the request is authorized based on the RBAC or the role-based access control, then the action is granted. In Kubernetes, the concepts are very similar to those in, in OpenStack. When a user uses kube control to execute a command, it is issuing merely an API request to the kube API server. And, and Kubernetes has a concept of role, also a cluster role, a concept of resources. And in my server, they have pods, ingress, config maps. However, it doesn't really give a clean way to, uh, to handle multi-tenancy. Though it does provide uh, a mechanism for us to inject a webhook to provide the authorizations and the authentication that's needed. Given the similarity between the two ecosystems, we want to really bring and glue the OpenStack and, and Kubernetes together. And there is a project right now in Kubernetes called the Cloud Provider OpenStack that will allow us to do that. This provided the, uh, the multi-tenancy and a unified IAM to both OpenStack and Kubernetes using Keystone. Using the roles that is already defined in Keystone today, we can then actually allow deny or restrict access to perform action on the Kubernetes cluster uh, based on the role, the username, or the project or namespaces. With this, we can actually expose the Kubernetes cluster to tenants so that they can actually manage the Kubernetes cluster with all the uh, uh, access control that has been provided for already in, in, in OpenStack. 
So OpenStack Helm recently have uh, put in a chart, a Helm chart, to actually realize this webhook and the ability to actually launch Kube ADM with this webhook in place when the Kube ADM brings up the Kubernetes cluster, that webhook will integrate with Keystone with uh, the authentication. And we have put this, actually, in the inside of the demo, we actually have this already in the zoo gate. Um, let me see if I can show this. Is it the other demo? It's kind of hard to read up here, but as you can see in here, this is a log actually from Zoo, and we actually created a um, a user here. Uh, if you can see, kind of right right there, we created a demo user and binded it to a to uh, to a namespace called I think demo uh, project, right? And then use we get, obtained the token using Keystone on this demo user and attempt to actually, you can see that we can use this when we're trying to get the ingress on the OpenStack namespace, which this user has ability is in that project, we are able to actually list out the, uh, the ingress uh, successfully. But as you can see right below this, if, we tried, if this user trying to list and do anything against the namespace, the default namespace in Kubernetes, it failed because the webhook had denied the, the access based on the role um, granted in Keystone. So as you can see, this allows us to actually use, leverage the existing OpenStack you know, Keystone's functionality to provide access, authentication, and authorizations to the Kubernetes Kube API uh, server. And then I think next Steve will talk about. Sure, the LME. Yeah, so I want to say it was early last year, not long after you know, Pete moved to this side of the world to start working with us. You know, our team was fairly small and Pete approached me one day asking if I'd be interested in you know, leading some of the development and exploring how we were going to, to not only monitor and you know, keep track of these services as, as they're running, but also it goes beyond that. It really kind of helps tie the picture together for people that we're trying to show this to because it makes it a little more real because then we can use things, the tools that we're using in our, our monitoring stack, our logging stack to show that these things are actually doing what we're saying they are and in a concise way. You know, for a lot of people, the, the ops side of things, you know, the monitoring, the logging, the alarming, it's, it's not the most fun thing in the world. It's not the most sexy thing in the world to some people. But it was a really great opportunity for me to kind of grow my skills, not only in the OpenStack space, because we needed to be mindful of the OpenStack services and where our control plane is, but also the underlying infrastructure that it's running on. So in our case, that you know, it spans beyond just the nodes that these services are running on. We've got to monitor things like Kubernetes as well. Uh, so it was an opportunity to create this, this framework that spans across you know, OpenStack Helm today, as well as things like uh, Airship, or whatever infrastructure uh, you wish to run this on. Uh, so just kind of give you a quick rundown. Uh, the framework that we're using right now, uh, we chose Prometheus for our monitoring, uh, mostly because it, you know, it's in the Cloud Native Foundation. It's, it's kind of a sane choice, I guess, in my opinion, if you're going to use Kubernetes. Uh, and really because it, it gives you a lot of flexibility as well. So uh, how we're using it now, we've got uh, we're using the node exporter for gathering metrics for our bare metal hosts. Uh, we're gathering metrics with C Advisor for the containers that are going to be running as part of our platform. Uh, we can monitor the Kubernetes objects as well with things like kube state, or, you know, kube state metrics, as well as the, uh, the metrics that are exported via the kube scheduler and the kube controller manager. We can also gather metrics from, uh, from Calico via Felix. Uh, as of the Luminous release, you can also get metrics via Ceph Manager now. Uh, OpenStack was the one that there wasn't really a Prometheus exporter out there for, but since that was you know, obviously a big part of our infrastructure that we needed to be mindful of, uh, our team, a member on our team, uh, Rakesh, a guy, uh, he's not here unfortunately, but he did a lot of awesome work in uh, creating this OpenStack exporter that we use. Uh, it's actually out in the open in our repository, and as soon as it's feasible, we're looking to hopefully get that into the OpenStack namespace. 
because it just makes sense, right? No one knows how to really monitor the OpenStack services as well as the OpenStack project, so it makes sense. Uh, Prometheus can actually monitor itself, which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, then also we've got uh, exporters for Elasticsearch and Fluentd, since we're using those for our logging stack. Uh, we want to be mindful of the, you know, the status and how Fluentd and Elasticsearch are performing. Uh, kind of touching on Prometheus a little more, uh, one of the other benefits of Prometheus is that it has a strong querying language that you can use, as well as relabeling. Uh, relabeling allows us to take the metrics that we're gathering via these exporters, and then if we need to massage the, the metrics that we're gathering and apply new labels to use in queries, or even creating new metrics out of a combination of others, it allows us to do that. But the big thing was uh, Prometheus has its service discovery mechanisms for Kubernetes are pretty strong. So how that works is we can tie annotations to the objects that we're looking to monitor. So for example, the exporters we're doing, if they're just deployments running behind a service, we can put annotations on those services. And then Prometheus is able to go and identify those objects and set up scrape targets on them to gather metrics by itself. So this is obviously very flexible in this sort of environment because as we're adding is we're expanding our control plane, if we're adding new hosts, scaling up services up or down, Prometheus is able to set up targets for those automatically, and there's no manual intervention required to reconfigure Prometheus and restart the service to make sure it's gathering the metrics that we need. Uh, the OpenStack exporter, um, I'm, I'm just gonna quit reading off my talking notes a little bit. I'm just gonna show you the pictures, because like I said, I think the pictures kinda show this off uh, really well. So this is the Prometheus dashboard. If we go to targets here, it'll actually list out the targets that I mentioned. So these are actually all, I think the only things that we have statically defined in the chart for the Prometheus configuration are things for uh, C Advisor and the kubelet. Everything else that's listed here is automatically discovered by Prometheus. So if you go and you kick the tires in the OpenStack Helm infra repo, and you walk through the deployment scripts that we have for setting up an evaluation or, a deploy or development environment for OpenStack Helm infra, you can actually watch Prometheus dynamically add these targets if you pull up this dashboard as you're going through and uh, deploying all the services that we have listed there. It's pretty cool. And then you can, these are the labels that I was talking about with Prometheus. So it'll actually show you what the labels that it wa that was gathered on these metrics before it applied the relabeling. And then also with the endpoints that are listed here, you can click on these and it will actually just, it might run a little slow, um, but it'll actually display which, uh, which metrics are being gathered via this exporter. So it gives you an idea of what it, uh, it exposes for you. So the, the, we can then use these uh, for our Grafana dashboards. And this is, this is really one of my favorite things to always show off. So all of these dashboards are provided by default as part of the Grafana chart that's an OpenStack Helm infra. And it provides dashboards for almost every aspect of uh, of an OpenStack Helm control plane that you would deploy from, you know, like I mentioned, Elasticsearch. Uh, we've got Ceph dashboards, OpenStack dashboards, even a dashboard for Prometheus itself because, I mean, if you're relying on your monitoring infrastructure, you really want to get that 10,000 foot view of how it's performing. So we can look at, we've got a Ceph cluster dashboard. This gives us an overview of how Ceph is uh, performing. So we get things like the status of the cluster, the number of monitors we've got, uh, the number of pools, our capacity, how much of our capacity we've actually used, as well as things like our IOPS, our throughput. Uh, we've also got specific Ceph dashboards for the OSDs, which is, uh, it's been pretty helpful. There's been times whenever I've noticed a slowdown, uh, I've noticed some issues with storage whenever I'm trying to work on something and having this to, to reference has been pretty nice. Uh, we've got a dashboard specific for the pools. But I think my favorite overall is the OpenStack dashboards we have. So I mentioned uh, the, one of the guys on our team, Rakesh, he actually put these dashboards together to uh, take advantage of the exporter that he created. So we've got a, an overview of the OpenStack services. So this will give us the status of uh, the APIs for the services that we have running. Uh, Cinder and Mariah, Cinder is not deployed right now and the MySQL exporter we have isn't deployed, which is why they're showing no data. Uh, it'll show things like uh, vCPUs that are being used, the uh, RAM that's being used by Nova. Then we can also, each of these services has a corresponding drill down dashboard. So for example, uh, if we want to look closer at Keystone, we can. 
And once again, it'll show us the status of the service. It'll show us the, uh, any errors that we're receiving, show us the response time for the, the res uh, request that it's receiving. It'll also put that into a histogram here and then show general API availability with this, uh, this line over time here. And like I mentioned, we have one of these for each of the OpenStack services, so it can really help you drill down and identify any issues that may be showing up. So we can also show you the Prometheus dashboard. This is one of my favorites, uh, mostly because I've spent a lot of time with Prometheus over the last year, so it really, um, the pictures are really cool. It shows things like the rules evaluations that are going on. It'll show you latency for any of the queries that Prometheus is coming show you the number of time series that are currently in Prometheus, so this can kind of give you an idea of the amount of data that you have in Prometheus that you're working with and that you have available to you. And I to remember another one that's been really helpful as well is Elasticsearch, um, mostly because one of the issues that comes up whenever you're working with Elasticsearch, both in a development environment and trying to troubleshoot issues is, uh, at least in my experience, has been issues with the, the heap size that you have configured with Elasticsearch. So you can actually go into here and you can, this will give you an idea of the resources that Elasticsearch is uh, consuming and how it's performing over any, or the period of time that you want to view, uh, which is really helpful. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's really it for the Grafana portion. Now moving on from, you know, the monitor, monitoring aspect to the alarming. So if you're familiar with Prometheus, it's, it's no secret that Prometheus works really well with, it, with, with Alert Manager. So it's got uh, native service discovery mechanisms for Alert Manager for identifying Alert Manager instances and making sure that it's monitoring those appropriately. And then Alert Manager also has built-in peer discovery mechanisms so it can identify any other Elastics or Alert Manager instances that are running so they can form together so there's, they're all getting the same alerts and being distributed appropriately. That being said, you know, a lot of people are also comfortable with something like Nagios because you know, Nagios is, a, from my experience, it seems to be a tool that's routinely used in, in enterprises for, to suit this need. And as someone's looking to maybe adopt moving towards a containerized control plane infrastructure, maybe they might be a little slower to adopt a replacement for something like Nagios. So Nagios, in its traditional sense, presented a, a challenge because it doesn't include those service discovery mechanisms that Prometheus does. So traditionally, you'd have to go in and you need to define your, you know, your host, your host groups, the service checks, and things like that. As we're scaling a control plane up or down, and we've got services going down and maybe being replaced, that would be a lot of manual intervention if we were looking to use Nagios in the traditional sense. So once again, Rakesh did some awesome work with Nagios, he uh, actually created, we've got a custom Nagios image that's also out in the open that he has included support for things like not only a Prometheus plugin that can query Prometheus for metrics to then trigger alarms based on, but it also includes a service discovery mechanism where it will actually go and query Prometheus and look for new targets or hosts that it needs to create based on labels that have been applied to the objects that we're looking to monitor which is really cool. So um, I'm sorry, it's really small. Um, I'm gonna try to click through here. So yeah, so we can see things like the, uh, I think this is the, so yeah, so this is our service status. These are all defined as part of our, um, part of the Nagios chart that we have by default. Uh, but we also have rules set up in Prometheus that can then be exposed and provide those labels like I mentioned for Nagios to be able to go out and look for and then dynamically create these, uh, these service checks and these host checks. Um, I think one, one of the other things about Nagios as well is that when everything else in your cluster is having a particularly bad day, Nagios just keeps on rolling. Um, so for, for us, even though it is probably the, the least informative of uh, the dashboards and other monitoring systems we have it's also in some ways the most critical because if everything else goes down it, it'll still be there yeah. and it's uh one of the other things that we've included as part of uh, the image for nagios that we're using as well is uh, we're using ceph for storage for or to back our storage for prometheus so you know if, if there's some an issue with ceph obviously we can't query prometheus for metrics related to ceph because Seth may be unhealthy or it may not even be there. So to circumvent that, 
there are, we actually take advantage of the Ceph plugins for Nagios as well, so we can query Ceph directly to see what the health is. So if we're noticing that we're not getting any response when we're trying to query Prometheus, we have a fallback to look at to see like, okay, well, this is likely the issue because we can see that Ceph is unhealthy. Um, and, and the great thing about, uh, as I mentioned, the rules for Prometheus are defined in the chart. The checks for Nagios are also defined in the chart. So all of these are values driven. So if you need to supply you know, any rules or checks that obviously are going to be particular to your own infrastructure deployments, it's rather simple to supply those overrides via the values in the chart instead of having to go and modify configuration files manually, which is, I think is a very, uh, it's very strong. Um, but that's, uh, that's mostly it for me. Um, anything you yeah. want to add? I think one, just before we close up and open up for Q&A, one, one thing that'd be nice to check is just see how that deployment we did in OpenStack is moving. Uh, the stack looks to be now fully created. Oh. Okay, so this this uh, this BML node has been up and running for twenty minutes now. Hopefully, if we now go into nodes. We've got an additional node, uh, so whereas before we had three, we've now got four, and it's it's up and up and running. Oh, that's the one from eight hours ago, and this is the one that was created 18 minutes ago. So, in this sort of space of time, we're presenting this. We brought a new node online, joined it to the cluster, and now we can start expanding and putting workloads onto it really quickly. And if we wanted to tear it down, it would be just as quick a process. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Are there any questions or? Hello. Uh, very interested in that monitoring stack of yours. Where, uh, where can we read more about it? Uh, you can actually go to our, uh, if you go to the OpenStack Helm infra repository, uh, there's uh, the documentation is slowly getting there. I've got a patch set open to like kind of break down exactly how to configure these services if you want to change them at all. But we do have, similar to what we use in OpenStack Helm, we've got a series of bash scripts that we actually use to run through the gates for these services. Uh, and it, if you follow those, uh, you can actually either deploy a, you know, a single node environment for this just to kind of kick the tires. There's also steps there for deploying you know, a multi-node to where it's, at the end of it, you can get the same dashboards that are here. Um, also, if, you, if you'd like, I can give you my contact info as well, since because I, I know the, the documentation's not entirely there. So I'd be happy to, to answer any questions you might have going forward if there's any, anything I can help with. And also, uh, also um, for bringing up a multi-node environment with our Armada tool from Airship, this is all included within that. So if you deploy a multi-node environment of OpenStack Helm via Armada, this stuff comes included in, in those default manifests. Oh, well, oh. In the production environment, Do you want to grab a mic? Just so, yeah. So, in a production environment, how would you, uh, in a new data center, uh, deliver your initial bootstrap node to your new data center? Have you thought of a specific mechanism to deliver that? Uh, yes, we we we've thought of it. <laughs> That's, that is actually one of the areas where we're, we're undergoing a huge amount of development at the moment. There is a thought of building a centralized controller, which we've been re referring to this week as the Cloud Harbor, which would provide a sort of workflow and part of our CI process, which would then push out that initial node um, or the Genesis host to, the, to these sites. Um, so that we would have a single pane of glass that would allow us to control the entire infrastructure, even though we would keep each each zone or site separate, and so that they, they there's no overlap or failure domain. You mentioned that it's not multi-tenant with the new airship deployment. What, what's exactly like? What are the major hurdles to get it to be multi-tenant? <laughs> 
Okay, so, well, obviously the, the OpenStack and other components deployed on top of Airship are multi-tenant. Um, when, when I make that reference to not being multi-tenant, it's more about our view of where Kubernetes is at the moment. So if you think about sort of, we're, we're limited by two things. Firstly, the security models in Kubernetes, which are rapidly improving, but also we're using um, Docker as our CRI runtime. And so the security concerns there, noisy neighbor issues, and all, all sorts of other things that mean at the moment, maybe multi, not being multi-tenant is a bit strong, but you need to have a lot of friendly tenants sharing a, sharing a cluster. So from our point of view, we would regard ourselves as the sole tenant of our underlay Kubernetes, and then have tenant-facing Kubernetes running in VMs at the moment, although potentially things like um, Kata containers or Gvisor, you know, as those things mature, would be, would be very interesting to us. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, everyone.